I think it's being recorded. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on today and pay my respect to elders past, present and future. Um, it's great we are restarting RK Talks in 2022 again. And uh, well, this is RK Talks number 26, uh, which is great. And um, as I can see, we have guests from around Australia and we have had a few um, and yeses, acceptances from around the world. So uh, it's, it, it'll be fantastic um, uh, to basically have uh, this question and answer and conversation after Dominic's talk. So we are very honored today to host Dr. Dominic Hess, the chair of the board at Greenfleet. Uh, Dominic is the zero carbon building lead in city of Melbourne and um, as we might all know. Uh, Dominic uh, previously was an academic at the University of Melbourne and RMIT, and she currently holds an adjunct fellow in uh, the city's research institute at Griffith University. Um, Dominic mixes theory and thinking with doing and testing, and as she states herself, um, her main uh, contribution is to think about how we can basically contribute to the well-being and thriving of place, people, and planet. Um, it's a great honor personally for me to host um, Dominique today. Um, she's a very special guest for me. She has been <laughs> my uh, PhD examiners. She's been the, one of the most meticulous <laughs> examiners and academics I've ever seen. <laughs> so, I mean, you'll see from her slides, um, she has nearly 80 slides. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's great to have you here, Dominic. Um, I'll just hand it over to you and I'll share your slides. Don't let 80 slides scare you people. Most of them are case studies and pretty pictures. There's not a lot of words, <laughs> a few words. <laughs> and uh, congratulations on your PhD, Parissa. Thank you. I can't believe it's already six years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, time flies. Perfect. Here you go. Thank you. Uh, so Parisa asked me to speak to you all about regenerative development. And I, um, the Regenerating Australian film was about to come out and so I thought that would be a nice provocation to to think about within this group so it's not just listening to me but you're also thinking about what this could mean. Um, these slides were adapted to ones I gave to the Australian Institute of Architects uh, last year uh, where I was talking about uh, designers being uh, the weavers of future potential of place. Uh, so, uh, weaving of the beautiful tapestry of potential. Uh, and so you'll see some references to that. Uh, and um, I think regenerative development is the process that could support, depending on how it's applied, uh, that weaving of the potential of place. Because uh, architects have been the leaders in creating the visions of place, right? To create the longing for something uh, amazing, beautiful, uh, poetic, etc. Uh, and I think we can we can use that to create a thriving, regenerative future. But I thought to start with, let's explain what regenerative development is, if I can get the slides to move forward, which I, I'm struggling with. Uh, to start with, uh, obviously, I need to acknowledge of the land that I am on and that I learn from and uh, am connected to. Uh, I'm thankful to be able to learn from the oldest continuous culture on this planet uh, and pay Jilly Brook, which is the local language of respect uh, for respect, the elders past, present and um, those that are emerging and stepping up to those roles. Uh, I live near the Mirangane Banong and uh, one of my reconciliation uh, initiatives is to learn more local language and that's the name the local la language for the for the river the Maribyrnong 
And it's interesting that once you dig into the Indigenous languages, uh, you start understanding more about the place. So uh, Mirren Ganeibanong, so um, my understanding is that uh, the, some of those words are the yam. And so it was an area where yams were collected. Uh, it flows into Nurm, Port Phillip Bay, uh, the local mountains that aren't really mountains but hills <laughs> compared to other countries are uh, the worthy Yuangs uh, and I live uh, in the clan of the Yulit, Yulkit Willem, which means river camp or river, river dwellers. So I'm um, very uh, honoured to have spent time and, and to be in this country learning from this uh, wisdom of place. Uh, a little bit of background, uh, I'm a bit of a strange, strange person with a very interdisciplinary background. I uh, started in science, uh, went into engineering, then into architecture and now into governance um, as, a, as a board director um, and chair. So uh, always looking at where I can contribute most and where I can be of service. I've written a few books um, and, and done a, a bits and pieces here and there, uh, some of which I will share with you. So today I was going to explain to you what is regenerative development, um, at least my take on it, uh, why it's gaining momentum, how you do it, uh, and uh, after the provocation of the 2030 movie, uh, go through some case studies to see how that matches uh, with the thoughts that you will have had yourself through the provocation. Oops, going too fast. So why is regenerative development an emerging concept? So to discuss that, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about innovation and, and the S-curve of human development. Uh, not that this trajectory means um, progress is always a good thing. Uh, progress is measured differently by different people and um, uh, in this case, through this organisation, uh, it is through GDP or, or wealth. Uh, financial wealth, but anyway. Uh, as we go through human development, uh, we do, we see this uh, idea and you will have seen it either as an S-curve or as a kind of hump where you've got the innovators, the early adopt, uh, adopters, the, the middle, uh, the late adopters and the laggards. Um, so you've got this just in a different format. So um, somebody comes up with a new idea, the steam engine, um, people go, that's a stupid idea, but more and more people start seeing it solving some problems that they had before. It's more efficient, creates more power, etc. And then suddenly uh, there comes a point where everyone goes, oh yeah, that's actually a good idea. There's a huge take up of it. And then they start seeing limitations again and somebody's starting to play around with electrical engines, everyone's poo-pooing the electrical engine um, and then suddenly they realise, no, actually it's a good idea, uh, the steam engine drops off and the electrical engineer, um, the electrical engines take off and so we see this um, and this is an example through technology but we also see it through uh, various aspects of, of human development. The key thing is that uh, that idea that um, you start off uh, with uh, a, a way of doing things. Um, people accept that way of doing things and everyone starts doing it and then they start seeing the limitations of that way of doing things and new ideas come up. Uh, and this is the work of Jan Rotmans that says that we, uh, we're in an old paradigm of extractive um, linear thinking and that we're seeing the limitations of that and uh, we're currently in this tipping point where we're starting to experiment with what the new things are and regenerative development sits within this new thing where it's more circular, uh, it's, uh, it's um, less linear, uh, it's less extractive, more relational um, and so forth. So that's where regenerative uh, high end, um, development uh, kind of sits in that challenging the old ways of thinking and saying this is potentially a new way of thinking that addresses some of the problems that we're seeing ecologically, socially, economically and so forth of the current way of thinking. So to put simply, uh, the sort of old extractive linear way of thinking, uh, you could use this particular saying which you'll all have heard in some way, um, give a person a fish and they'll eat for a day. Uh, I've tried to find the source of this. Um, it's been attributed variously to uh, the Bible, uh, to uh, China, 
uh, and to uh, various authors that have interpreted things along the way. So uh, there's not a definitive source of this particular saying. And if you do uh, know where it comes from, please let me know. But anyway, you know the saying, right? Give a person a fish and they'll eat for a day. Um, so this uh, means that the, power to, uh, the person doesn't have any agency, they are dependent on your generosity, uh, you, they will do what you say um, because if, you don't, if they don't, they don't eat. Uh, so it, it, it's a very um, power over kind of thing. And it's, it doesn't enable that person to learn the skills to fish themselves, it doesn't enable that person to have agency over their lives. So as you'll be aware, the next bit of the saying is uh, teach them how to fish and they'll eat for a lifetime. Except if you think about it, you teach them how to fish, then uh, the value and the success is measured by how many fish you catch. Uh, the catching the number of fish without the context of the environment in which the fish live can lead to uh, the overexploitation. Um, because the more I catch, the more important and successful I am uh, and therefore uh, the better I feel about myself and I am measured by the number of fish. Uh, and that uh, is how you could see um, that old paradigm. So uh, we've, we've shifted from, uh, we've shifted to uh, all learning how to fish, uh, but uh, we haven't fitted that into uh, the context of the reality of the world. And this is where Indigenous knowledge, and I've been listening to a lot of Indigenous thinkers and speakers over the last few years trying to um, improve my understanding and knowledge um, of our ways, uh, of this place. And uh, they say, you know, we come up with lots of ideas, but we should always test it against the reality of place, of the reality of, of this country, of this location, of my town, of my where my house sits. So always relating things back. So if this is the old way, and we're talking about a shift from this old worldview to this new worldview, then uh, what would the saying turn into? So from giving a person a fish, to teaching them how to fish. What is that uh, more relational, more contributive uh, way of thinking? And it is to teach them to love the ocean. It's not to say don't fish. It's not to say don't uh, eat fish. Uh, it's not to say don't learn how to fish, it's saying learn to uh, be who you need to be in the world in the context of understanding your role in the world. And if you love that, if you love the world, if you love the ocean, then you look after it, uh, then you do not over exploit, then the measurement of success is not how many fish you catch, but how thriving the place is that you are within, how thriving the ocean is. And that is what we're talking about with regenerative development. Regenerative development is a, is a process, a tool, a concept that people have used to try and describe this process of um, teaching people to love place, P teaching people to love uh, their, their role, their place, um, how, can, how they can contribute. So as I'm going through this, uh, think about yourselves as architects and how you enable the people that you are designing buildings for to love the building, to love the place, to feel empowered, to uh, care and nurture through that love of place. So regenerative development, you could see it as a sort of process, a, a thinking frame, a, a way of taking us through our decision making so that we are creating that love of place. Uh, it sees uh, that we're part of the system and if we aren't supporting the system to thrive, then uh, we can't thrive. So as a, as a big challenge there, the idea of um, profit, right? Profit is taking uh, a benefit from a system and taking that away from the system to invest it somewhere else. Uh, yourself, a big car, a house holiday, um, something else, big diamond. Uh, that is taking from the system. So to a certain extent, the way that we have set up our economic systems um, is one of the issues that is part of the old paradigm that is inhibiting our ability to learn to love the ocean. Uh, so if we are part of the system 
and the, for us to thrive, the system need to thrive, we need to contribute to that system. And we do that by looking at the whole, uh, looking at what is the essence of place um, and trying to build up the vitality and viability of the whole. And here I've got an example of uh, a project that I'm working on called the paddock. The paddock's in Castle, Maine. Uh, it's located on a degraded piece of land that uh, has been altered irreversibly, um, not irreversibly, but significantly since the gold rush era, era where the trees were taken down, water courses were changed, uh, and then agriculture. Uh, we're taking this piece of land and we're building 28 homes on it. Um, but in building those 28 homes, we're asking the question of how can we bring the systems back the ecosystems back, bring them back to thriving. And how do we measure that? We measure that by the return of the powerful owl, the growling grass frog, uh, the sun moth, uh, the, the cute little glider and the legless lizard. When they come back to this site, we know that we have everything because they're apex species, everything underneath them, the soil, the microorganisms, the amount of water, the nutrients, everything must be uh, thriving for these animals to come back. And we're creating healthy living building challenge energy. Can, um, we create more energy than we use um, and uh, create food and so forth. Lots of other stuff, but we're also creating the space for eco ecosystem thriving. And it's still making money, right? It's, it's, it's a project that is still, um, as much as the, the people that are making the money on it are reinvesting that into their community, um, it is done under a standard uh, economic model so that we can show that this is possible. The key message that I'd like you to hold in your hearts is uh, when you're teaching someone to love the ocean, uh, it, when you're teaching someone to love the place, that sense of love isn't measurable. Um, that sense of agency, that sense of attachment and belonging isn't measurable. So as much as we can Im improve the ecosystems, the water efficiency, the, the health, the energy efficiency of the projects that we're working on, the real uh, magic source of regenerative development uh, is to also look at how do we build that non-physical capacity? How do we build those immeasurables, the sense of belonging, the sense of attachment, the sense of agency, the ability to um, have a positive relationship with place and to contribute to place. How do you measure a smile, a hug, uh, those sorts of things that make you, um, you know, think of your favourite place. What is it that, that you feel? How do you measure that? Um, and so that's part of what regenerative development um, is aiming to do, to create that sense of commitment and attachment to place. You could say uh, that sense of country. Uh, here we have the site before. Well, it's not exactly the same site, but you can imagine what it looked like during the gold rush. Um, and now what we're hoping to do is improve it to the point to bring those, those critters back. Uh, in fact, uh, the people that are living there now, because we've released the first three stages have been built and the fourth stage is under construction now, they send me photos of these animals as they return. And I got one the other day of an echidna and I'm like, oh, well, we didn't design for the echidna, but how wonderful that the echidnas also return to site. And I can go more into that project if you'd like. So when we talk about the, the non-physical aspects of a site, um, this is a uh, example of that for the paddock. So the paddock has, uh, here we have stages one to three, and here we have stage four. We have these views into the site. And one of the things that we uh, worked on for the site is how do we engage people and help them to feel agency and belonging to the site. Part of that is uh, celebrating the history um, and connecting to the history of place. And so we have five different views into the site here. And each of these views celebrates a different period of history. So uh, here we have the blue one, indigenous um, history. We have the gold rush history. We have uh, the um, agricultural history. We have the current quirky, arty, music, foodie history. Uh, and then we have the future, the purple. Uh, now, we haven't curated those views. The intention is that the community that lives here can decide what, when and how they would like to curate these spaces to celebrate these periods of the site. They, they are free to choose the artworks, choose the stories they tell, 
um, and take as they pe take people through and have visitors come visit, um, they can share their own uh, reflections on, on that history. So that is an example. Uh, you see here um, in this um, diagram that the trees, um, the elevation, how the water is going to work and that idea of the, the raised beds that will be growing the food. Um, there's also an orchard, uh, there are bees, or oh, there will be, um, there's a, sh a men's shed, a yarning circle, so a whole lot of investments into place. So um, here's an image of, of the interior of one of the houses. Uh, we used citizen science to do the initial ecological research across three different um, seasons, looking at what was the soil like and so forth, uh, so that you know in five and ten years' time we can go back and, and see what, what have we actually contributed, how have we benefited. Uh, we looked at how to improve the ecological capacity, as I've spoken about. Um, the, the homes are higher density than you'd have in a normal sort of development, but that leaves room for uh, all of the other things that are there, the growing of food, um, the yarning circle, etc. Uh, we used building ch living challenge, uh, living building challenge as the uh, the tool to help guide the design of the homes. We did the biophilia workshop. One of the outcomes was that idea of the different views in. Uh, and we did int intentional community research. So how would the community like to manage themselves? Uh, <clears throat> and this is not um, in any way a academic study, but the anecdotal outcome so far is that there is increased agency, belonging, attachment, contribution and well-being, uh, much of which is immeasurable um, because of this project. And, and they're beautiful homes. They're, and they're, they're a joy to be in. And if you come down to, uh, to Melbourne, uh, to Castlemaine, you can um, book one out. One of, one of them's an Airbnb. So to show you some evidence for this, uh, in one of the homes, which is the Airbnb, is at the top, the bottom is a meeting room, and it has a communal laundry and where they share their recycling and, and, and uh, products that you don't need to have one of each in each home. Uh, but within that space, they have this board here, this white board, um, and on one side it's got the native grasses and on the other side it's got the introduced weeds. So the community themselves organised for an ecologist, a, a, a grass specialist to come and hold a workshop with the community to explain to them how to look after the, the site, um, know which are weeds, which are native, uh, so that they can look um, at the site and uh, be part of the journey of the ecological potential of this place. So what we show here is agency. They chose to get somebody in to help them know this uh, belonging. They're stepping up to take care of the place. Sense of attachment. You don't do this if you don't care, if you're not attached to the place. That sense of we're going to have a working bee to, to look at the grasses, um, that sense of contribution. Um, and the well-being outcomes, again, anecdotally at this stage, uh, is uh, they have spoken very highly about uh, how the paddock has supported them through COVID, the fact that they could catch up together, that they had this shared space, even if they couldn't go to each other's houses, they could um, share, feel that sense of, I need something, I can get my neighbours to get it, um, I can collect it from here without contact, etc. Um, and every Friday evening they have drinks, um, and uh, here is the last time I was uh, there. You can see this is where phase four is going to be built. So that's still under construction. All the houses are to the back here. Here we have that pond and the sound of the frogs was uh, almost deafening. Um, and this little fella here and I went um, uh, and collected the sounds and sent it off to the frog people. And they confirmed that the growling grass frog is back. Um, and I can also report that uh, the owl is back. Obviously, owls love frogs uh, for dinner. So uh, they've come back uh, and also the butterfly has been seen or the, the golden sun moth. Uh, we're still waiting to see the uh, legless lizard and the glider. Um, and of course, the echidnas come back too. So there's the power of this kind of thinking within a project. Uh, and um, for me, this is kind of the most beautiful little outcome. So as part of the project, um, Jeff also retrofitted a house um, rather than demolishing it. And this was a little note uh, that was uh, just left in the letterbox uh, for this house. 
uh, and I'll read it out to you in case you can't read it. This is really out of the blue, but I've watched what you've done to transform this house. I just want to say it's amazing how you've given this house a new lease of life and you're amazing people for giving this house the opportunity to be this beautiful. Thank you from this 16 year old. That's the power. It's not that the house is energy efficient or beautiful or living building challenge or anything. It's the, the impact it has on giving people a sense of love of place. Right, so that's what we're talking about. So if you think about what a regenerative Australia and regenerative architecture could be for Melbourne, Australia, Perth, uh, the world, what would it look like? What does it mean for you and your career going forward? And I've got to say, retrofitting is a key thing. How do we uh, celebrate our existing infrastructure? So how to do it? Um, and Parisa, you will give me a five minute warning, right? At the high level, spend time to really understand the context, the history and the flows that bring a place to life. Um, I almost, you know, it's a golden rule never to read your slides, but I almost want to read them just to emphasize the points that I think, you know, I, I've put a bit of time into this. Um, but yeah, think about how you can enhance the potential of the relationships and the flows. So, you know, a water through a site in a, in a pipe has no relationship to site. You have it meandering through site and suddenly you have those benefits of the grasses, the frogs, the urban cooling and so forth. So think about how to enhance the potential. Don't hold on to the end product. Regenerative development is about how something enables capacity to evolve and adapt. It's not about staying the same. Build the capacity for those to be involved, to feel that they have some agency, um, some rights, some responsibilities. And always ask how your project is nurturing place. How is it generous? How do you design things to be generous? But remember, regenerative development is as much about what you do to how you turn up to it. So it's about the impact on you as well. And so, what contributions can you make? What's uniquely you? Uh, what practices can you bring to help those that you work with reach their potential? Um, and that's both for lecturers and students. You know, students out there, uh, when you come to a lecture, you can hold a lecturer up and help them be the best by nodding and supporting and, and making eye contact. Or you can be looking at your device um, and, uh, and not having that relationship with your lecturer. So there's always a way of turning up for something to make it better for everybody. Um, and don't forget the fun. Always fun. Um, connect. Take the time to be in nature. So I thought that's a, a, just a good little um, point to just say, you know, regenerative development isn't because it is this story of capacity building um, and your love of place. It's also about you and how you turn up. Most of us know a project, even as students, you know, someone's not pulling their weight, it drags the whole potential of the project down, right? Um, as in development projects, one person poo-hooing an idea and not enabling that, um, that creativity to happen uh, means that the project doesn't reach its potential. So looking at how you turn up is as important as what you do. So um, I've been working with um, Indigenous folks and um, they've been driving what does regenerative development mean for Australia and um, have a look at this, this website. Um, it is a, a slow and emerging um, uh, response to. Uh, so initially the Commonwealth asked us to create a regenerative roadmap for Australia and we started with um, Indigenous consultation. They went, roads? Roads? How colonial of you. <laughs> It's song lines. Song lines are uh, the story of this place. And if we're going to talk about regeneration and the thriving of this place, we need to talk about song lines. Anyway, a segue. So hopefully everyone has watched this little movie. I have no idea if this will work. No, it won't. Um, so uh, it is a 17 minute movie. I understand it's being launched in um, Perth over the next day or two. So look it up, get yourself a ticket. It's free for under 18s. Um, and um, have a think about everything I've spoken to as you're watching this movie. Now, I realize I have another maybe 10 minutes. So um, have a, as I'm going through these 
case studies. They're all examples of different ways that projects have tried to embed some aspect of capacity building, some aspects of teaching to love the ocean into them. Have a think about what this could mean for how you practice and how you could think about regener a regenerative, uh, sustainable, thriving, abundant, generous 2030. As much for yourself as for those you're designing for. So as I said, when you um, are working on a project, think about the flows, the relationships between the flows and uh, the place and how to build that capacity for people to have the agency to be able to adapt with change. That's the basics of regenerative development. That's the basics of working ecologically. Oh, that's a great image. <laughs> so what I'm showing you there, which you're not seeing, uh, is that project in uh, Seoul where they uh, took a road uh, and they brought it back uh, to uh, a river. Now, there is a longer story of this than that I usually tell, but uh, we don't have time for that. Um, but suffice it to say, it took the person uh, who did this uh, two terms in office uh, to enable it to happen. Um, because before this, uh, he had stories of uh, how, uh, from his grandparents, how this river used to connect different communities and how it was a thriving place. And it was his vision to bring that potential back to place. So it went from being in a pipe to having relationship with place. Uh, and so that's that idea of flows and relationships. So here you see it uh, at night. Uh, here you see it uh, during the day with people enjoying the space. Suddenly this water has relationship with place. Um, the results, you see it during a festival, um, are also uh, economic benefits. Uh, there are a drop in urban heat island. Uh, there are cafes popping up, people are celebrating and nature's returning too. You'll see some images in a minute, uh, here we are, of, of birds and fish and uh, a mother and child watching, watching the nature. So a tool that I use, which uh, Parisa is in the next slide, uh, is a tool called Lenses. Uh, Lenses is a tool in the US and it just takes you through a process to help people um, understand what the potential is. I don't have a lot of time. Uh, oh, no, that's the same one as before. Um, and maybe this is a sign that we're going to finish this uh, chat a little early and have more time for questions. Um, but what Lenses does, uh, oh, here it is. Oh, comes and it goes. Uh, it is a little tool. Uh, it has this underneath bit, which is what are your intentions? So what, what does your client, what's the potential of place? Um, and it gives you some standard ones that you could integrate. Uh, it then asks, what are the flows? So you look at a site and you think about what are the flows? Um, and Parisa, maybe I'll, I'll send you a little video that explains this in a bit more. But to understand what brings a place to life. Uh, and then it challenges you with how do you bring these into relationship? How do you take each flow from degenerative to regenerative? And then the most useful thing I find, um, oh, sorry, this is just that intention of taking it from compliance through to regeneration. It's beyond being net positive, you're actually making things better. And this is the tool that I love because it takes those flows and it helps you to understand. So say for a community and these are your focal points, what does a degenerative project look like? What does a sustainable project look like? What does a capacity building um, teaching a person to love the place look like? And it does that for water and for money and for transport and for energy um, and for lots of things. So it really gives you an ability to shift your thinking for a project from here to here and to take your community along with you. And that's free online. And you can see in the slide deck, it's got the, um, it's got the link there. All right, so Bull Street is that project. I'm going to flick through these as, as quickly as it allows me. So that was the building as it looked like, and that was the little um, note that I read out to you earlier. Um, so it was the precursor to the, um, the paddock project. Um, and 
this was the project that we used to test some of the typologies and the ability to do the living building challenge. Uh, and again, there's a video embedded here, which uh, we can't show you because of the system we're playing on, but hopefully uh, Parisa can share the slide deck as opposed to the PDF and you'll be able to watch those videos. So here you've got some images uh, of the, the building as it uh, looks now that it has been retrofitted. Uh, Nunduk, a uh, much bigger project, uh, is a, um, uh, along Gippsland Lakes and uh, the, this is a, a real equal story. It hasn't been completed yet, it's just gone through planning, but you can see this tree here that's in the water, you can see it here um, and uh, when I was there last this tree had fallen down. Uh, so this is degrading by about a metre a year. Um, not only that, but uh, the, the water is salinating because of what uh, was done um, opening up lakes entrance to the ocean um, and that's killing off the land which is ma making it degrade more quickly. And so the question was how do we regeneratively provide the capacity for the land um, and uh, also um, provide um, that investment of people and passion. Um, it was actually shown at the Biennale. Uh, the Venus Biennale, where there was a real interest in regenerative development. Uh, there are some, some images here uh, of initial concepts of what it would look like. Uh, we worked with the Gunai Kunai people um, and they um, and that allowed us to use the word nunduk, which means bark of a tree. Uh, and we worked with those that underneath side of lenses, you know, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve a regenerative off-grid, restoring ecosystem, zero emissions, geothermal based um, system um, that's immersive, restorative, intelligent. Uh, and as I said, we did a lenses workshop with this, uh, which uh, developed a bigger picture and then came down to this. We also ecologically looked at how do we provide a system so we're bringing um, mangroves down that have already established further down the lakes chain and bringing it up and seeding them up here and creating a stability barrier. Um, the building itself sits here and provides that barrier between the salinating water and allows the freshwater ecosystem to re-establish behind it. This area has gone from 88 species of bird to two. Um, because of that salination of the water uh, and there's a much longer story which I don't really have time uh, to go into but you can see how the architecture itself provides the barrier that enables and again this is a video that when you get the slide deck you'll be able to watch um, for yourselves but we're also working on the social regeneration how do we um, connect people better to place and the story of place um, and the indigenous capacity of place um, again, there's a link there, you can see a lot more of that. Uh, and it's already, even though the building hasn't been built yet, the narrative around the creation of this building has already created um, this, um, this walking trail past there to tell the story of the place. And there's some costs and timing, again, slide decks are there. Playa Viva is an ecotourism, a small one in Mexico. Um, this is a wonderful one. Uh, and I'm going to go through it really quickly uh, and I'm only going to tell you one of the stories but one of them was that these turtles here, um, the poachers uh, used to sell off the eggs and the turtles um, and uh, the, the population was in collapse and part of Playa Viva uh, was to turn the poachers into um, me not mentors, I'm using the wrong word, had the custodians of the turtles. So they got an official title, they had responsibilities and their KPIs was the well-being of the turtles uh, and the number of species return and so forth. And so instead of their KPIs being, and, and they get paid by the tourism resort um, as part of the tourism and they teach people about the turtles and they have that custodial relationship uh, and that's brought the population back and there's many stories like that for this project. But this place is a nursery, it used to be um, a, um, a mangrove going into an estuary, um, turtles, it was a place for new life to be birthed. And what people find when they come and stay here is that they come up with new ideas, new ideas are birthed. And so you see that within regenerative development that, that, that what happens physically often mirrors what happens um, in the non-physical, in the ideas, the capacity, in the attachment, in the potential of place. Um, young people are staying um, and the village is thriving instead of um, having the road from the airport 
bypass the village, it goes through the village and everyone stops and, into, and connects in with the village. Um, and people are, are invited to contribute uh, to um, the village. They're invited with the custodians of the turtles, they're invited with uh, the weavers, they're invited with uh, the, the people that are growing the food to contribute. So just some images of, of Playa Viva. Um, I promise I'm coming to the end, but I love this story. Um, Loreto Bay, Jacques Cousteau called this the Aquarium of Mexico, um, which uh, across a 30 year period saw the almost dying out of every fish. Um, when the people um, who bought this area to develop it as an eco resort retreat for people from the US to come and retire, uh, they had a lot of um, backlash. Uh, and so they brought my colleagues from Regenesis in. Uh, and what Regenesis did is they changed it from a concrete um, new urbanist design into one where they actually designed to bring back uh, the mangroves um, and the estuaries uh, and so forth and um, actually started restoring the forest upstream and so forth. Um, and what they've found, as I show you in the bottom here, is that the whale has returned, which means if the whale's returned, then the fish must be better. And I'm sure it's not just Playa Viva, uh, not just um, uh, Loretta Bay that is uh, responsible for this, but it is part of the story of the potential of projects to, um, to actually look at the ecosystems and work with the ecosystems. Not saying people don't live here, people can still live here, but live here in positive relationship to place. Um, and, and it's the architects and the urban designers that are a critical part of that conversation. And we're almost done. Two more slides. And that is that you will find that a lot of people are throwing the term regenerative uh, development around. And so here are some questions that you can ask of any project. Um, is someone setting themselves up to be a hero through this project? If so, um, then um, they're probably not doing regenerative development because um, the wisdom is in the place. The wisdom is in listening and taking the time to connect to the people of the place. Um, and if you pretend to have all of the answers, then you're not listening because there are always more questions and always more potential. What, how are they benefiting the place? How are they encouraging everyone to show up um, and, and be a positive contribution in involving students, um, looking at involving community, bringing back nature, etc. Hopefully I've given you some stories to, to back that up. Um, and, and finally, how are they benefiting the marginalised, the silent? The, um, you know, when we talk about regenerative development in Melbourne, I ask, how do we, how do we involve the street people? How do, how do they feel that they belong? How do they feel they have a role in the future? How do we um, involve nature in the conversation uh, and so forth. There's some resources there if you want to know more, um, some very short videos. Um, I also wrote a book and there's a video there to the interviews. Uh, and so as we finish up, I'd like you to think what element of what I've told you today resonated and what are you going to do about it? Um, thank you for your time. Time for questions, Parisa. Um, such a beautiful narrative, lots of amazing projects that um, I guess are a beautiful translation of the original design. Thank you very much for that, Dominique. Um, I personally have a question, but I would like to open the forum to audience if anyone uh, would like to start asking a question. You can turn on your mic or just type and I'm happy to read that for Dominic. Maybe stop sharing so I can see everybody. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting presenting to a slide and seeing no audience. <laughs> Hi John. <laughs> Hi John. <laughs> Lovely you to see you. Turn on your mic. Yes. Um, Thank you very much, Parisa and Dominique. It's really good uh, to see uh, to see uh, you talk about and hear you talk about about uh, this topic. Um, I was interested, I guess, in uh, what you uh, said when you were talking about the uh, Castle Main uh, project that you were doing, um, and and you were talking about uh, uh, measuring measuring its success, I guess, and and. Um, and uh, talking about how anecdotally there was, uh, it seemed that uh, it was quite successful. And you did say that it wasn't um, 
an academic uh, uh, study, if you like, about uh, its success. So is there potential here for, for uh, someone to, to actually try and quantify uh, the, its success? So um, the, the quantification is interesting because a lot of the, the things that are most wonderful about it are difficult to quantify and it's a, a sense of how a place is thriving. But yes, so we did the baseline studies of the ecological systems beforehand with the intention that in five and 10 years time, there would be a, a follow-up quantitative study to see. Um, I've left academia, so hopefully somebody else will do that. Uh, but um, uh, we needed to finish the buildings, right? And uh, the building, the whole process through COVID has been delayed by quite a significant amount. So that's why I say anecdotally, because um, people are sending me photos of the owls um, and the butterflies um, and the, the, the frogs and so forth. Um, but uh, we haven't done any measurement because the project isn't finished. Um, and, and the intention was uh, we would give it five years to settle and for people to um, do build relationship with place and do the weeding and, and so forth and, and to then do it. But absolutely, I think they would love someone to follow up. Okay, so uh, Dominique, uh, I'll, I'll get in touch with you separately, I think, about this. It's not to bore everybody Fabulous. in the... Uh, in the room. <laughs> thanks very much, Dominique. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I think we have anyone else? I think someone raised the hand, but I. So, so when I designed this, I thought we would have a little breakout room where people could imagine um, and be provoked uh, by the ideas, but. Um, yeah, technology. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully, um, people have been provoked. Um, and um, it, it I can see some chats. Uh, yes, people. Um, um, they're very much inspired. I um, think I'll, I'll continue with my question, um, if the audience don't mind. Um, my question is, um, I guess, an overall question, Dominique. With all these, you know, fantastic projects and your, you know, involvement, do you think we in Australia, we are on track and have we done enough towards our net zero targets? Hmm. Great question. Um, so the thing with regenerative development, right, is that what you're doing is the building the capacity to change. And so it might feel like things are very slow and we're not doing it fast enough. But remember the S curve. So, you know, you've got the first 8% are your um, early, are your innovators. Um, then the next 9% are your early adopters. That makes 18%. And once you've done that, it goes into uh, the upkick where everyone takes off. And, and that means that what we need to do is create the capacity in that 18% to, to within distributed through architecture, government, um, energy markets, mining companies and so forth to think in this way so that when we that momentum to change happens, we can do it in a regenerative way or we can do it in a net zero way. And what I'm seeing is that there are more and more people building that capacity to change we just have a lot of systems that are holding us back because we don't have that sense of as much as it's urgent for many people in the world, that urgency isn't there. Um, but we do have the capacity to do this. And that's what I'm seeing that we're building. So are we moving fast enough? Not by a mile. But can we? Yes. Definitely. Yes, I agree. I agree with you. And I think, um, you know, the, the capacity you're talking about is very important and um, I guess um, at least to me you know as an academic person I guess this um, collaboration or interdisciplinary type of you know projects um, would make a big difference you know a translation of research into practice because um, uh, one of the major problems for me uh, would be, you know, yes, there's lots of research this side of the world and um, 
whether this is being practiced and translated into you know reality um, that's that's a different story and it, it is very interesting for me that uh, a person like you coming from academia bringing that knowledge you know into the real life um, uh, th th this is this is a fantastic opportunity uh, that we need to um, basically learn how to combine the two which which you you guys do a little bit you've got a great living lab from from memory that is through you guys where where you are embedded within a place where you are testing these things and i look at yes. it and i go oh i wish i was over there that's so cool um yes, so, yes. So, you living know lab you are doing that yeah that, that's right that's right yep yep there was a I big guess... question there but i um i missed peter I missed, oh peter newman there hey peter Are you happy to turn on your mic, Peter? I am. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks for everything there. And um, I'm getting bad feedback. Um, the issues that you then raised about what's happening here, we have, we have projects that you're involved in that you didn't mention. I just wonder if you could quickly talk about our paper that's now about to be published on the uh, on this regenerative project in the western suburbs of Perth. Um, but we also have WGV, which has uh, certainly you can quantify its regenerative um, outcomes now. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, um, working, uh, one of the reasons I can come to ASA is because Peter and I have been working on these projects um, in Perth. Uh, looking at that potential, bringing together the living building challenge um, examples uh, and those um, that ecological narrative uh, potential. Um, so yeah, um, maybe we can share a link to that paper, um, Peter, to to the group here. Um, that would be fantastic. In the chat. Yes, uh, it's um, you, you are doing some really amazing stuff in Perth. So it's it's not just over this side or the re somewhere else in the world. You are doing great stuff, and and, and Peter is at the spearhead of that. So um, sorry, Definitely. Peter, I didn't know you were here. I I would have um, uh, had more of a conversation with you on this. Um, <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> Peter. You are on mute. There was a longer question, Parisa. I didn't quite catch it as it went through the. Sure, um, I will um, look at the chat box. Um, Jasmine also raised her hand. Jasmine, would you like to ask your question while I'm looking at the chat box? Hi, Dominique. Jasmine Palmer here. I just have. Um, I'd just like to inquire about your views on how we can leverage and access and enable regenerative development relative to land ownership and, and tenure, or if you see any influence of land ownership and tenure um, on projects, the collaborative ownership of land, the individual ownership mm. of land. Uh, so I just sort of, as a society obsessed with owning our piece of dirt, um, I wonder if you have any reflection on how that influences how we move into a more regenerative future. Such a great question. Um, and hopefully we can um, discuss it over a few bottles of wine because I think it's one that needs that uh, sort of a lubrication to, to really explore um, the potential of it because it is a scary thing. You know, I think about my own home and having paid that off and, and that sense of security that that gives me because of the framework in which I, I sit and, and that in that idea. So for me, I, I have been reflecting and, and I can only speak to myself. I think it is the intention you bring to the ownership that is the issue as opposed to um, the idea of ownership. So if your intention of ownership is that idea of custodianship, where your intention is to, to enable people to thrive through what you do on that piece of land, ecosystem and so forth. Um, if your intention in ownership is as a mark of, um, I'm a success because I have so much money and so much land and, uh, and I am holding on to it to make more money um, and, and you aren't building that relationship, that custodial relationship with that land, 
I think that's where um, that is the problem. And, and I'm just speaking as I'm thinking here. So this has not been thought through other than for my own walking around the park and thinking about this because it's the relationship that ownership entitles us under the current linear thinking system where success is measured by um, finance money. Um, that is the issue rather than that concept of because you know I've had this conversation with traditional owners and I say well aren't you traditional custodians and and they say no we're owning the right to care for place it's not that we're owning the land we're owning the right to be custodians of place and 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 I think that that's a nuance that and I'm nowhere near the end of sorting that one out in my own head but it's such a fabulous question thank you Jasmine Thanks, Jasmine. Um, Kevin asked, when researching and exploring uh, a project's regenerative opportunity, especially the economic aspects such as the turtle custodian roles, are economic consultants part of the process? And what are your suggestions when approaching these aspects outside of the built environment? Well, there's a lot of elements to that. Uh, so, um, John Fullerton uh, is a regenerative um, economist uh, who uh, has some great stories around the potential. So money's a flow, right? Money is not bad or good. It's what we do with it. Same with ownership. Ownership is, uh, it's what you do with that concept of ownership, uh, not the word itself isn't bad. Um, so money is a flow and that flow can be used to increase the capacity and capability for a place to be vital and viable or it can detract from it um, by extracting it and taking it elsewhere. Uh, and so that intention of, um, and, and again, this is one that kind of runs around in my head and I'm not, no expert in the economic side of things, uh, but uh, within the paddock, uh, it is, it has been developed with an intention to create a profit, but that profit is to reinvest in the community, not to be taken away. Um, so uh, the intention is to demonstrate that it's possible to do it under the current metrics of success. Um, uh, and so, um, all right, and so how to not do it in the built environment, which is not the end part of that question. I probably missed a few sections of that question in the middle. Um, sorry, just to jump back to Play of Eva and the turtle custodians. Um, so I'm not sure of how they work that out economically, uh, but um, the intention is that uh, some of the money that you spend when you go and stay there um, goes into the maintenance of these sorts of things. And so when you're buying the food, the food comes from the biodynamic um, farm and that money goes there. Um, when you pay for a tour with the turtle custodians, then that money gets. So it works in that way. Um, and it's about a thinking of money as that resource, that flow, that in relationship with, to place creates that increased vitality, viability and capability. Um, then um, the how to be beyond built environment, uh, I think it's the same. So um, uh, for example, I had a project where I needed to get a marketing company involved um, and pay $50,000 instead. Um, I went to a marketing university and I said, um, you know, I'll give uh, your students $1,000 each to come up with a concept um, and engage with this idea of regenerative development and so forth. And so, um, you know, those students were rewarded. I ended up with the outcome I needed because um, I gave them a safe brief as I would have given the marketing company for 50,000. But I spread that money along among a, a whole lot of other people that then were able to engage with the content. So it's, yeah, it's how do you invest that flow, be it water, energy, smiles, hugs, um, time online uh, to create increased vitality and viability is what regenerative development asks. Beautiful, thank you. Thanks, Dominique. Anyone else has any question? I just noticed we're at time. So, yes, um, yes. Uh, it is two minutes past 12 uh, for us <laughs> in Perth. Um, and uh, I guess um, it's around 3 p.m. should be um, in Melbourne. Two, two. Oh, We've two, had daylight two savings. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, 
Many thanks, um, Dominic. That was great. Um, I think Peter might want to share a link. Um, uh, am I right, Peter? Or are you happy to email it later? Because uh, Peter, you I don't, I don't think it's been us. published yet. He was saying yeah. it's about to be published. Oh, ah, right. Published. Okay. Yeah. No worries. I'm sure we will see that soon um, when published. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for your time and hope to see you in person in Perth. Me too. Me too. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Cheers. And lots of thank you messages for you, Dominic, in the chat box. Yeah, I couldn't see that. I mean, the chat's just popped up briefly, but I couldn't see the whole chain. So it is at the bottom of the page, um, bottom right, you see that little bubble.